This is Chick Sands in Bedfordshire. I can't tell you exactly what goes on here, except to say that it's a military intelligence centre. That building over there is the officer's mess, but it was once part of a 13th century monastery, the site of a homegrown British monastic order called the Gilbertines. Something fairly risky was going on in there 800 years ago. Nuns and monks living together. It was an experiment that caused a scandal. How did it work? How were they kept apart? In recent years, some walls and even the occasional burial has been found here. And now the commanding officer has allowed us in for just three days on a mission to sort out the naughty nuns and monks of Chicksands. Defence Intelligence and Security Centre Chicksands. 0900 hours, and so far, despite a few suspicious looks... Bill Arden. Time Team's unique collection of individuals are being allowed onto the base. Mick's keen to go straight to the building, which was originally part of a Gilbertine monastery, a British order started by St Gilbert in the mid-1100s. Everyone's been asking me what I've done to my head. Well, I hit it on my front door, that's all. A likely tale. It's true, a it's a true. likely tale. So this bit is part of the early monastery and it's 13th century, but this isn't, right? Yeah, well, in fact, there are 13th century bits inside here, but the whole thing was turned into a country house at the dissolution, so a lot of what you can see is much later. If you look on the air picture, look, we're standing here outside this block here, and you see there's a cloister behind, these buildings behind there. And the monks and the nuns all lived in this bit? No, no, well, that's the thing about Gilbertine houses. There's two sets of buildings, one for the canons living, one for the nuns. So we've got one cloister. There must be another one somewhere round about. So we've started geophysics off, and hopefully they'll find another cloister with another set of buildings round it. Where is geophys? They're over here, look. Have we started yet? Someone who can't wait to find out what's here is the man who invited us into the base. Chris, you have made this man so happy. <laughs> Fantastic. He's got a monastery <laughs> size. But why well, are you excited about it? Well, I'm excited about it, Tony, because, um, first of all, it must be the finest military base in the country. Secondly, we're in the Curious Brigade. You know, we like to know things, and this is a Gilbertine <laughs> monastery, and we don't know much about them. And you don't mind that we're going to have to destroy your wonderful norm? Oh, we mind hugely, Tony, as long as you put it back. Um... <laughs> the surviving bit of this Gilbertine priory, with its 13th century vaulted ceiling and its 15th century roof timbers, can't help but whet the appetite to find more of this British monastery. These buildings are thought to be where the men lived, because the cloister they're set round is relatively small and there were half as many monks or canons compared to nuns. The question is, where's the nuns' cloister? Geophys have been refining the survey work they did here in 1993 and may have the answer. I mean, we've re-surveyed this now, this morning, and you can see, if we look at it in colour, this looks to be like a building in there. Oh. So do you want to get in and have a look at that, mate? Well, I think we should do, yeah, to see if it's medieval or not. How do you feel about that, John? This is exactly what we want from English heritage. It is a very, very important site. It's of the very first order. It's a guardianship quality ancient monument. And as a result, we've got to be much more careful. It's protected by law. So where we trench has got to be the exact right position. Basically, what you say goes. Yes. He can't get spade crazy. <laughs> no, it's going to be a very <laughs> surgical job today. As this 13th century doorway is thought to have led into a church, Mick thinks that, rather than under the lawn, here at Chicksands, the missing nun's cloister was probably attached to the other side of the church, somewhere in the area of this cobbled courtyard. Well, I think somewhere in the grass here. Yeah. Right? Somewhere about here, yeah. I reckon, 
is where we could get the north wall of the church, right. the cloister, and any range going off this way if the cloister is on that side. Okay. So I reckon in here is critical, right, John. And okay. I reckon we, we, you know, we need uh, the ground radar. Right. But irrespective of that, I think this we should put something in here. As radar moves in to check out this area, the disappointing news from our first trench is that the geophys over there seems to have been detecting just natural rock rather than archaeology. Stuart, though, who's been looking at the aerial photos, is interested in this area just outside of the massive garden ditch called a ha ha. I'm, I'm going two different directions as well at the moment. In, yeah. in one is based. That's clever, obviously. It is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> On the air photography, mm. there is a clear indication of a rectangular. That's this structure. thing we can see here. That's right. Yeah. And not visible on photography, but just a few metres down from it, along the Ha Ha, is a regular platform. You can see various lines on here, can't you? Yes. I think it would be worth examining what either or both those structures are, in case they are parts of cloisters or ancillary building. Okay. That's, that's one direction. Right. Now yeah. I'm going the other direction. <laughs> Does the other direction involve my trench over here? It involves right. coming back to the north of the, of the main right. building complex yeah. in this garden area. Yeah. For two reasons. This is... The high ground up here. Yeah. Now, if you're looking mm -hmm. for a church, the high spot is actually in that area in there. Yeah. And the way this plan is perpetuated through the early mapping, you've got one quadrangle type of feature yeah, and a series of other quadrangles up yeah. here. And that's the only thing that's consistent in the maps. That suggests to me that we ought to investigate this area yeah. mm -hmm. for a second cloister. We're now looking in two distinctly different areas for any sign of monastic remains in amongst these buildings and out on the lawns to the east of the surviving cloister where we're opening up two more trenches. And if this wasn't enough, both the military and English heritage want to know more about a monastic cemetery thought to exist in this area. Something like 12 medieval burials were disturbed when a water pipe was put through here in 1969. Geophys have located the water pipe. It's looking quite good. Oh, brilliant. I mean, there's the pipe trench. Yeah. And then this rectangular blob here, that coincides with the graves and the tiles. Barn is starting another excavation next to where the pipe trench disturbed the burials. He's intrigued because lots of tile was reported as being found with the graves. Here's the, the section from uh, the 6970 dig. Yeah. And you can see quite clearly that the man has drawn three layers of floor tiles. Yeah. But oh, significantly, yes. what he's done is he's finished, uh, finished them off within the grave cut. They don't extend outside the grave cut. No. So to my mind, that means that they're actually associated with the burials. And that's not in a building? Well, the only place that I know where you've had tile cap tombs or tile cap graves is in churches or chapter mm. houses. Well, I've never heard of one out in a cemetery. Yeah. So we want to find out if this is actually in a building. That's why it's right. a really significant dig just here. 1530 hours, and would you believe it, we've got a second trench with no archaeology in it. The brigadier's given himself a day off and volunteered to help backfill it. It's all because I don't trust the time team to get properly. <laughs> but so far, today's produced no trace of the nun's cloister. Yeah, that's good. Excuse me? <laughs> no, that is good because. You know, we, we, the only clue we've got to what these places look like is the plan of Watton, the one, the Yorkshire one, right? Yeah. Which has got the two cloisters with the two sets of buildings. Yeah. But I think there are real problems with this. This, this one, which is the Cannons one, is based on very little bits of evidence. Well, there's huge, great walls here. Yeah, but they're dotted in. They've, they've made these up for the. So they're just water. speculation. Well, a bit more than that. But you know, it's, it, I don't think that's clear, and that yeah. we don't actually know that there's anything going off on this side of the church down here. So are you saying that, when did they dig Watton? Oh, about 1900, it's a long time ago. Which would mean that our cloister might not be out in the garden at all, it might be somewhere else. Well, I mean, I think that's something we have to reckon with now because we've looked east of the surviving cloister. In, it could still be to the west of the building. Yeah. That's behind the building's the other side. And we'll look there tomorrow. But I think my money now would be that it, with a shared church, it was the other side. And it was actually to the north of the buildings where the brick buildings are today. Yeah. Well, hopefully, this trench where Jenny's working will find out if the nun's cloister was here to the north of the church. 
although Jenny herself won't be actually doing much digging tomorrow. Jenny! <laughs> Robin! <laughs> a little bird tells me that, uh, how shall I put it, you've, you've volunteered to become a nun for 24 hours. I have, yes. I'm going to start at 12 tomorrow lunchtime and then I'll do a whole cycle of the monastic day through till 12 o'clock the next day. You're staying here while we all troop back to the hotel and a good three-course dinner? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, the whole time. Why? <laughs> Given that uh -huh. I've studied monasteries and we're here digging up a nunnery, it seems like a good opportunity to actually find out more about what it was like inside because it's so hard to get an idea from... Uh -huh digging up bits of walls and stuff, so... Does this remind you of anything? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what I've got to wear? Well, that's what, you, that, that's what the average Gilbertine nun looked like, certainly. Wow. I think that's going to itch. It, it speaks itchiness to me. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, we'll be creating a virtual nun's cloister for Jenny to be locked away in tomorrow. Today, though, Ray Sand's been working with architectural historian Richard Morris to create an impression of what the surviving bit of the Canons Cloister may have originally looked like in the 13th century. Finally, as we approach the end of day one, Phil's got some good news for us. He's actually found some archaeology. We got our wall, we reckon. Look, we got the chalk core there, which is actually going back underneath Ian's feet. And have you got any finds that go with yeah, the Yeah, we're getting some really good Look finds. At this one. <coughs> Window glass. Oh. This one's got paint on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can actually see the sort of. Uh, yeah. Like like reddish coloured lines. It would have been clear glass, yeah. colourless glass, but perhaps with a pale green tinge. And these uh, designs would have appeared black with the light shining through them, but yeah. they've oxidised in the ground. That's so that's great. that's fairly 13th classy. to 15th century. And decorated in coloured glass was to tell a story, wasn't it? For people who couldn't read. Mick doesn't believe the nuns cloisters in this area. He thinks it's more likely that the wall Phil's unearthed belongs to the monastic infirmary, which was traditionally to the east of the main buildings. Beginning of day two, and this building is this here, which is part of our 13th century monastery. Mick thinks it's the bit where the monks, or the canons as he calls them, used to live, and that there ought to be a similar building somewhere where the nuns lived. We spent yesterday looking here and we couldn't find it, but we did hit on a wall which we think was part of their hospital. So now we're looking over here, which is this piece of grass behind that prefab and we've also put in a trench over here. Jenny? Yeah. How's the trench looking? Um, might be promising but we need to give us a bit more time. Okay, that's in this little bit of grassland here but we can also look here which is through this archway. The commanding officer's already said that if we want to we can dig up these cobbles Although, frankly, if I was him, I wouldn't let us. We're also opening up another trench on the lawn to see if we can find a wall to go with the one Phil unearthed yesterday. Mick thinks that if this does belong to a medieval building, then it could be the infirmary because of its position to the east of the surviving cloister. So it's just a sort of tip line? Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. Oh, oh. Handle. You all right? That's great. That's a rod handle from um, a medieval jug. Can you see it's got little Oh, it's got the, it's got the smashes in it, yeah. Yeah, it's decorative, but it's also so that the handle fires right the way through. And it's quite small, so it'd be a small jug. It's 13th or 14th century. All time team investigations involve a careful trawl through the old maps and documents, but normally I don't get to see them. But Stuart, who's looking for clues about the wider monastic landscape, called me in to see an original map that he reckoned was pretty special. Look at this. A whopper. That's lovely. This, this is a, a map of 1855, which was made for Sir George Osborne, who, who lived at Chicksanders Priory, which shows all the land he owned at that time. But it's a spectacularly useful map because it gives us a number of clues to the extent of the priory and the lands around it. There's the priory just to give you a clue where we are. Yeah. But if you look around it, some of the field names, we've got Miller's Close, which is an indication of, of a mill site. We've got the Warren, 
which is an indication of where rabbits were, were being farmed. And the real gem on here, actually, for me, is this field called Conduit Field. Here. And why is that significant? It's significant because the priors would have to have a supply of fresh water and there should be a conduit house somewhere with this site. And What does that mean? What would a conduit be? It's like a wellhead where water comes out of the ground and you, you cover it over to stop dirt and debris getting into it and then you pipe it up to the priory through lead pipes and conduits. Which is right. Robbins found a lease from 1727 that helps to locate the monastic hospital. And it refers to all that messuage or tenement called or known by the name of the hospital, which presumably represents the old uh, priory infirmary. Which we may have found. Uh, well, then he goes on to include various small fields, including uh, one called the Warren. And that suggests that since it included a field called Warren, we can infer that it was on the east side of the Priory, somewhere in this vicinity. Which we think is in the general area of these trenches. And maybe Phil is digging the infirmary, whereas Barney's trench, much further to the east, is investigating what we believe is a monastic cemetery. Barney. Hi. Got a couple more volunteers who uh, you might be able to use uh, in your trenches. Fantastic. Are you good at shifting spoil? Well, what's here is we've got, you can see, a, a rectangular shape of tiles and stonework. And the tiles are, they seem to be roof tile and floor tile. But uh, contrary to what I was thinking yesterday when I said it, was, it looked more like a rockery, it looks very like what they found in 1969 in the section here, yeah. with a layer of tiles right over a grave. So now I'm quite excited about this because I think we're back on track to find burials underneath mm -hmm. this capping, which is really unusual. So what makes you convinced that there is skeleton underneath rather than...? Well, I'm not convinced yet, but... It does seem to have a taper to it. Yeah. It looks yeah. like it's got a sort of trapezoidal shape. Yeah. And uh, grave cuts are very often broad, obviously, at the shoulder end, because yeah. the head would be at this yeah. end, yeah. and they narrow down towards the feet. No more digging for Jenny. She's going to find out about life in the 12th century by spending 24 hours following the timetable of a Gilbertine yeah, nun. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So you've taken off all your underwear. I still got my pants on. <laughs> that is really bad. What are we going to do with you? <laughs> All right, well, not on camera, but later on we'll take them off because medieval women, as far as we know, didn't wear knickers. In fact, there's evidence that they didn't. So, uh, okay. Right. Otherwise, you won't be able to appreciate the coarse fabric. And, uh... <laughs> okay. Wimple me yeah. up. You're starting to look like a nun, but the most important thing really is the headdress. And if you were you were entering a monastic community like this, the first thing is that you'd actually have your your head shaved. Um, yeah, so your hair is really annoying. Lucky they yeah. decided not to go for total authenticity, but they have done a sort of virtual Jenny no, having no, her head shaved. That's awful. <laughs> <laughs> to show you what you could be looking like right vanity, now. Vanity, that's vanity. It's all Thanks. about giving up the body and, and ownership of your own personal body. And the hair, especially for women, is a kind of symbol of, of sensuality, and it's about stripping all of that away. And obviously, taking on a common habit so that you're wearing exactly the same clothes as every, one, every other woman in the community. Yeah. So there's no sense of, of in individuality or the sort of person that you were before you joined the order. Having taken a vow of near silence, a Gilbertine's life was all contemplation and prayer. Jenny will spend her 24 hours as a medieval nun inside this building on the other side of the base. A combination of Victor's drawings and modern technology will recreate the 12th century environment. It's not going to be easy. She can't see the monastery, but she's determined to strictly follow the rule of St Gilbert. Lunchtime. Normally a chance to talk over ideas, but for Jenny in our 12th century refectory, her meals accompanied by readings from the Bible. And this captain climbing the mountain on which the prophet then dwelt. What She's having now? pottage, which is a kind of um, vegetable, barley, kind of thick soup, I suppose. Just water and, and barley. That's right, yeah. And, and a few watered herbs. down ale, Roberta so, saying, yeah. yeah. And some very hard bread, very heavy. Mm. Historians who've, who've looked at religious women's writings mm. and writings about religious women have actually called this holy anorexia. 
Yeah. 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 And they've, yeah. they've compared it to the modern condition and, and come to the conclusion that women were trying to control their bodies and possibly try and make them less feminine. For women, you really only had these two extreme models. You had Eve, uh, the sort of sexual temptation yeah. and yeah. lasciviousness and all of that, or you had the Virgin Mary. Mm. And obviously nuns are trying to be the Virgin Mary and to remove all the sort of aspects of, of the female body. And fasting to the point yeah. of you know near starvation and, and anorexia is one way of doing that. 1400 hours, 21st century chick sands, and Mick and Stuart go up in the helicopter to look at the sight from the air. 1410 hours, and we now have a problem because Geophys have got some exciting results which need acting on now. Thankfully, we've got another monastic expert still on the ground. This is the ha ha. Phil's trench is going across this anomaly here. And now we've got all these rectilinear responses. Could that be the cloister garden there? It's, it's very tempting to see it as a possible cloister, but how does that actually compare with, say, the size of, of the existing cloister and the, the location? <laughs> well, if you look on the map, this is the area we're, we're looking at the results from. There's the small cloister there, and when you transpose it, it's about the right, right. size, a bit smaller. So another target to dig, about 50 metres from Phil's trench, which you can see in the background. As monastic expert Roberta Gilchrist is only with us today, we're very keen for her to look at the four tile-capped burials now revealed in Barney's trench. I asked Barney if he still thought these graves could be inside a building. Well, I think, it, I think we're outside. If we were inside, I would expect to see these made much, much more neatly and made up of beautiful floor tiles. They would have been set into a floor. floor slabs. These, these are a lot rougher and cruder. So does that imply that they're probably people of quite low status in the monastery, do you think? It, I think it implies that they're outside, certainly, you, you know, in answer to your, your question there. But they are marking these graves, aren't mm. they? And mm. that's got to be mm. significant because it, it wasn't, you know, with the modern churchyard where you see all kinds of gravestones and things like that. We don't think that a, a medieval monastic cemetery would have looked like that. They mm. might have had uh, timber crosses and memorials and things like that, possibly. Um, but very rare to have external graves marked in this way. So they must be significant yep. in terms of either the status of the people or where they are. For example, they might be facing onto a path running through the cemetery so that you're, you're actually drawing the eye to the, to the graves. And the idea, of course, would be that uh, passers-by would offer up prayers mm. for the mm. dead. I know Mix decided that the nun's cloister isn't out here on the lawn, but this trench, opened while he was in the helicopter, has come down on what looks like the most promising archaeology yet. If it is the nun's cloister, then we're talking about something that could have looked like this, and it's where Jenny spent the last hour and a half learning psalms. Now she's about to spend 30 minutes in church to simulate the first of eight services that a Gilbertine nun would attend in a day. There was this special role of the nun sacristan, and so for perhaps seven out of the eight services a day, one of the sisters would be taking the service herself. Okay, she wouldn't really be That's formally. That's very strange, isn't it's it? It's very because, I mean, they really need a man to do the, the sacraments, don't they? A well, canon to. She, she, they only formally take the sacrament when there is a, a, a priest there. Right. Um, right. But even then, it would be passed through this little window yes. from the canon side of yeah. the church, and yeah. she would be the one holding the yeah. sacrament and passing it to the nuns. So you've got the nuns and the canons helping with the services, but then you've got these other groups of the sisters and the lay brothers as well, haven't you? It's this unusual structure which St Gilbert set up, and it was the lay sisters, for example, would be doing the work in the kitchens, they would be primarily doing the laundry, that sort of work, to yeah. free up the nuns. The lay brothers would be doing farm work and manual work around the estate and that sort of yeah. thing. So there's yeah. four groups within yeah. one monastic community. Although Jenny's unaware of it, the news out on the base is that her trench and the others dug here to the west haven't found any sign of the nuns' cloister. Problems with electricity cables are preventing us from digging where we'd like to in the cobbled courtyard. Although we haven't given up on this area completely, we're planning a radar survey here. And Stuart's also on the hunt for traces of medieval buildings in the cellars. You're a bit puffed. 
I am, Tony. It's been a hard day in the trenches. Out on the lawn, Phil reckons the wall he found 16th century and not substantial enough to be part of the monastery, which means once it's recorded, we've got another trench for the brigadier to backfill. But as we approach the end of day two, the latest from Barney's trench is that a female human skull's been exposed. But as it didn't have any tiles covering it, osteoarchaeologist Margaret Cox suggests that we record it and cover it back up to concentrate on the more significant tile-capped burials. But the best news is this trench, opened up while Mick was in the helicopter. Could we have found the nun's cloister after all? It's 1800 hours, we're all supposed to be having drinks in the officer's mess, but we're not. <laughs> we're all stood out here, staring into this trench. Yeah. What's going on, Mick? Well, I think this really rather changes everything in, in, in the area east of the present buildings, which I was certainly beginning to write off in my mind. It suddenly turns out we've got medieval walls with with pieces of carved masonry coming out. This is Mary's trench, where I thought it was probably just a garden wall. Well, exactly. You look three inches beneath the topsoil, yeah. yeah. you've got convincing yeah. medieval structures. Let me stop you for a minute. You said convincing medieval structures. John, what I can see is two <laughs> bits of stone mm -hmm. and a line of brick. No, OK, no, we've actually got a, a line of clunch there, which is actually a, a wall. And I think the What's fine clunch? clunch is like a hard, hard, chalky stone here. And it is used as a building stone, and it's faced, so it's clearly a wall of some description. And I think actually the finds that we're getting out of it, it now looks as if we've got fine ashlar remains. And uh, I know it's. Uh, have a look at these pieces here. With evidence for window glazing as well. That's the slot that yeah. the window yeah. goes Which in. Which could be later medieval, maybe post medieval, yeah. but yeah. you know this is the the, the strongest evidence yeah. I think you've come yeah. across on the on yeah. the site for uh, possible medieval foundations in situ. So Mick, if all this stuff is really exciting and we're having problems over the other side, yeah. then what are we going to do tomorrow? Well, we're going to get the, the geophysics enhanced for this area and then because we know that some parts of it there seems to be nothing and other parts it's quite well preserved, we'll then pick what we think is the best preserved bit to have another look at it. The more we learn about this, the more it'll either turn into something that is cloister or isn't cloister and they're by implication will tell us something about the area we can't look at. And the chances here is that we can actually do that without really disturbing it very much at all because right. it's just below yeah. the topsoil. Yeah. So we can do this, we can investigate it, but we don't have to damage or destroy yeah. it. So from my point of view, that's a result. It's exciting. Shall we have drinks? Indeed. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs> the officer's mess in the west range of the surviving cloister is spectacular. But foregoing her end-of-day drink, digger Katie Hurst visits Jenny, who's going to be here through the night attending numerous religious services. So, um, how are you feeling? It's really strange. It's... I don't, I don't even know what time it is now, but I don't think I've been here that long, but it already feels really strange actually looking at you, because I'm supposed to keep my eyes down and not look at anybody. I feel quite nervous talking yeah. to you. <laughs> And you get a real feeling of how people would become very spiritual just reciting the prayers. And I think that's the end of your visiting time now. The beginning of day three, and over here, where yesterday afternoon I thought we'd got a garden wall, it turns out to be a beautiful piece of medieval building which could well be the key in our search for the nun's cloister. And our first job is to go down, down, down until we hit the floor. Why? Well, we need to see what the floors are like because that'll be a real clue as to where we are in the complex. If we get really highly decorated tiles, that's what you'd expect in a church or a chapter house, whereas other parts we'd expect ordinary plain tiles and elsewhere we'd expect no tiles at all. If this is the cloister, it's a bit of an embarrassment for you, isn't it? Yesterday afternoon you were saying, yeah. oh, I don't think the cloister's here. My money's still on the, the northern area, but, but uh, in, in the end we're just you know, trying to find out where it is. Mind you, we are one archaeologist short. Yeah, Jenny, I wonder if she's getting on, I'd love to know. Catching up with our Gilbertine nun, I can tell you that she went to bed as instructed at 8.15 and was woken for the first of the night services at 2am. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. After a half hour service, Jenny could go back to her straw bed. Getting up for the four in the morning service was when I think my mood changed because that's when I realised that my day had begun and I, I wasn't ready for it. 
at 4.30am it was time to wash, although the nuns couldn't take off their habits as they weren't supposed to look at their own bodies. Prayers at 5am, then another service, prime, at 6am. If you were under 30 years of age, and Jenny assures us she is, you were allowed breakfast, a bit of bread and some ale. Sewing at 7am for an hour in the cloister. At 8 o'clock, the nuns attended daily mass. Out of all the services we did, the one where we celebrated the full mass was the most interesting, because in that we actually had the sort of disembodied canon's voice coming to us from the other side of the wall. As a group of women, we spent, had spent a huge proportion of our time praying. Amen. Um, but we still needed that man, and he was a man we couldn't see. Jenny's experience will be over at 12 noon, by which time we should have plenty to show her. Nice, lovely, isn't yeah. it? We're finding lovely it's bits of 13th nice century pottery. The neck, it would have been a, a pot bellied jug, and it's got a, a little pulled spout there. Phil's found some better preserved medieval glass. We got that line which comes up like and that. round like that, and then it comes round there, up there, yeah. and then it comes across. Yeah. The pattern's difficult to see because of the decay of the glass, but Debbie thinks the lines represent foliage similar to the design in this window. In Barney's trench, furthest from the standing remains, the tiles are being lifted to reveal what we think are medieval graves. Steve, what's going on there? A large void. Oh, good gracious. Tiles. It's going an awfully it's long way. It's gone a long way down. How far has it gone? It's gone down to there so far. And that's not hit the bottom? Barney said these graves are only two feet deep, sort of maximum, and you've gone past that already with the stuff you've already taken off. Good four feet. Four feet deep. So Barney might actually have a four feet deep burial, mm. which he says are really, really yeah, unusual. Mm. It does actually yeah, feel, if you stand on it, it does feel very... Hollow? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to move that back. Yeah. You should put a plank across I'm going to, to work back. from a plank. Because we don't want you vanishing into no, a grave. No, I don't grave. want to vanish into a grave. <laughs> Apart from anything else, you might damage a skeleton. <laughs> Yours or an old one. <laughs> Never do Typically, it's all happening on day three. And although I don't want to miss anything in the trenches, I'm determined to find out about the big scandal linked with the Gilbertines in their early history. Having tracked Robin down, I asked him to dish the dirt and tell me the story of the nun of Watton. It appears that as a, as a young girl of four years old, she'd been committed to Watton by the Archbishop of York. And the result was that she grew up without any real re religious conviction or vocation and became friendly, I think that's the safest way to put it, with a lay brother or canon of the house at Watton. And the net result was that she became pregnant. And when the other nuns found out, uh, they were horrified. The, the canon fled and was captured and brought back. And the nuns then forced this unfortunate girl uh, to cut off uh, certain crucial parts of his anatomy, which the nuns then stuffed in the unfortunate girl's throat. Why did they do that? I think they were so horrified at what had happened. It struck at the very root of everything they, they believed, the reasons why they had uh, given up the world, the flesh and the devil. And presumably they needed to be seen to be reacting very forcibly to any promiscuity that might be taking place. Absolutely. The intriguing thing is, and why this story is told, uh, is that although we hear no more of the unfortunate uh, canon, uh, the nun was closely confined, imprisoned, and she supposedly had a vision from the Archbishop of York, who spirited away the results of her pregnancy, and miraculously the fetters and chains from her legs and arms dropped away. And this is one, of course, the real reason why they retold the story, because of the miracle, not of the horror that preceded it. So what happened to the nuns after that? Were they able to continue practising being Gilbertine nuns? Well, the earliest record of the Gilbertine rule under which these people lived uh, was drawn dates from the, 12th, the late 12th and the early 13th century. And I'm sure it was so strict uh, because of this very tale. I must confess that when I was reading The Life of St Gilbert this morning, I fell asleep and dropped the book. The chapter meeting really reinforced to me what a strong part discipline played in the life. I really did drop my book sort of very early on in the morning when I was just too tired to stay awake and read. And having confessed to that, I had to lay 
prostrate on the floor, which seems incredibly extreme, sort of from a modern point of view, to humiliate somebody in such a physical and public way. And it really is much harder than it looks. It, I thought it would just be a rest lying down on the floor, but it's really very uncomfortable. Look at that. Oh, oh it's a big, it is a continuous right, slab. Yeah, right to the wall. Meanwhile, back in Mary's trench, we've reached the floor level and found just what Mick was hoping for. Yeah, oh, blimey, yeah. That's floor, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a glazed medieval tile, isn't it? And this is the strip around the edge, presumably, isn't beautiful. it? beautiful. Yeah. Why do you say that's around the edge? Well, it's a very thin bit, isn't it? It's yeah. not like the full big square yeah. tiles. But this says high status. This is going to be in the core part of the site. Very, very nice. High status more likely to be where the nuns lived than the hospital? Well, no, not necessarily that. I think we actually could be talking about the hospital, which was also, and maybe a chapel associated with the hospital. Why, given that we seem to have something that's like what we came here to look for, yeah. do you both think it's not it and that it may be the hospital? Because we've got a lot here, but we haven't got anything anywhere else. And we would be looking for a huge complex, bigger than that lot. So it still doesn't suggest to me that it's a huge, great claustral area. Mick thinks we've found the join between several buildings here, and by his thinking, this is an exterior wall. So, Mick, what would be the function of these little half-circular things here? Well, they're going up to support an arch, uh, going over the top. Oh, I see! So you've got an arch going up here, yeah. so you've got a building over here, and you've got an arch going up there, so you've got a building well, yeah. over yeah. here. So, so that has to be this the is the inside. And that's, yeah, that's got to be the outside. Why didn't to try and establish the width of one of the buildings, <laughs> Phil's opened up a small trench here. I have to say it's rare for us to find anything that looks this impressive, but what is it? What do you feel the date of these various bits of masonry are? Yeah. Well, they look completely different and slightly earlier than what we've got in the standing buildings. Oh, that's good. You've got these round columns and that yeah. small block work. I mean, it almost looks like 12th. Ooh. Or very early 13th. I like the sound of 12. <laughs> <laughs> but then you've got one more of these little colonnettes, which tends to put it back towards the early 13th, maybe. It's, it's a colonnette around a door, or right. possibly an arcade. So they have a cluster of Yeah, you have of a cluster around. of them. Yeah. Like we've got in the, the west door, still surviving, I'm for, for the For the big church, yeah. Right. Exactly that. Now, $64,000 question, really. <laughs> what do you now think this might be? It's obviously some sort of quadrangular feature. It could be a cloister, but whether it's the missing cloister or whether it's a cloister for the infirmary. So you would see that corner there as a corner as of being a... in the corner of a cloister. Yeah, I would. I couldn't sell you it as being outside the building, could I? Uh, no, ah. not at the moment. Right. You haven't got much weathering on the masonry. It's beautifully crisp, so it could have been right. protected somehow. Right. <laughs> so that's really in another uh, roofed space there, you think? Uh, quite Somehow. possibly. Quite possibly, yeah. Right. So would your suggestion then be that we should look that way at the geophysics to try and sort that yes, out? Yes, very much so. The question is, will we be allowed one more trench and where would we position it? Fortunately, John Ette agrees we need to know more. This is all excellent. You know, we know we've got quality here, but we just, I think, need a tiny bit more to look at function mm. and also to, to dismiss the issue of Grand Cloister. One last smallish trench, it's decided, will be put in fairly close to where we're digging already to test the geophys results in this direction. Meanwhile, over where we thought we're digging the cemetery, Barney's a worried man. <laughs> I can't I hear, take I hear, it, Mick. I can't take I hear it. having a bad day as a shoulder to cry. <laughs> What's going I'm on? I'm having a bad day. What's going on? Well, we've dug down underneath these two grave markers, and yeah. um, so far we haven't got a burial. No. <laughs> but we do have, underneath the, the plank, he's yeah. put it down to protect it because we've got to widen the grave. There's a whole bunch of disarticulated remains. This is what's really interesting, Mick. This is a tibia. And um, what you've actually got, these marks here, that one and that one, oh, yes. which are caused by somebody digging a grave when there was already a burial in there. And they've chopped into yeah, the bone, Yeah, these fact. are old yeah. cuts, which is really nice to see, Good because Lord, what, yeah. the strange thing is we don't actually see it very often, yeah. even yeah. though most medieval cemeteries are so disarticulated and truncated. Yeah. 20 minutes later, and much to Barney's relief, under the jumble of bones, no doubt shoveled in as the grave was backfilled, we finally start to reveal what appears to be a complete skeleton. It's lunchtime. 
which surely must be good news for Jenny because it means her 24 hours in the 12th century is almost over. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I'm off for a packet of crisps. <laughs> As it turns out, sleeping on a straw bed has made the experience all the more authentic. <laughs> but back in the 21st century, and a welcome change from bread and pottage. Before I started, I was really desperate that I would miss out on what was going on. But by the time you turned up, I didn't want you to tell me anything because I was in, in... And it must have been a really odd thing if you had relatives coming to visit you and you knew you were in there forever. Would, I mean, you would want them to visit. I was glad to see you, but on the other hand, I didn't want to know about what you were doing. But one thing that Jenny's commented out of all this is that she's not going to speak so much from now on. Yeah, I've decided... <laughs> so there's real positive outcome. <laughs> An awful lot of what I say is highly unnecessary. <laughs> So, Margaret, what do you think? Have we got any um, news on the burial? Yeah, we have. As, as far as I can tell at this stage, um, the mandible or the jaw suggests that it's a male. It's very robust with sort of right. flary, flaring angles here. And the clavicle or the collarbone is quite arthritic, which suggests an older person. And that's backed up by the fact there's an awful lot of wear on the back teeth. So that gives us, as a group, we've got the group of males yep. and the child that came yep. from the pipe trench an um, uh, elderly male here yeah. and a, a female, a, a from, female there. from there. So, and, and with all of that together, that doesn't really sound like a segregated monster. No, uh, there's uh, no evidence at of zonation at all here. No. This grave's so deep it's not easy to excavate. Margaret will be able to examine the skeleton more fully back in the lab. This elderly man could have been one of the monks or even a wealthy benefactor who paid for the privilege of being buried in the monastic cemetery. What we can say now is that the tiles capping these 15th century graves were almost certainly for ornamentation. These were high status graves and intended to be seen. On the lawn, the decision to put in this last trench has revealed more of one of the medieval walls and also something that Phil's been puzzling over for the last half an hour. How are you getting on then, oh, Phil? This is such a fascinating trench, Mick. Yeah. When well, we've got this wall coming along there. That's a continuation of the other one. That's right. It? Yeah, yeah. it does this weird bend round here and then yeah. it's shooting off round there. Yeah. I mean, it's a great trench, but I gotta confess I don't really know. Well, I don't know what that is. Well, I tell you what it looks like. It looks like a staircase. It looks like you know one of these spiral staircases in the corner. God, so, so that, you know, you have a central sort of thing <laughs> yeah. here and the steps going off round. Despite the fantastic archaeology discovered here, Stuart and Mick still think it's more likely that the nun's cloister was here and that the later buildings have been built over the medieval ones. Stuart reckons he might have found evidence to support this idea in the cellars under the courtyard. Well, you've certainly got three separate phases there, from the early 19th early 17th possibly, and then possibly medieval. A geophys radar survey in the courtyard appears to have picked up what could be a substantial wall three metres under the ground. This is the problem, isn't it? When they dug the trenches in here in the past, they found nothing. But actually those trenches look as if they were very shallow. Yeah. Yeah, right. uh, and, you know, yet we're seeing things at depth and we've got bits of wall at depth, haven't we? From your surveying work, mm. as distinct from any of the little clues that you've talked about so far. Is there anything that makes you think that the nuns' cloisters might be here? Yes, I think there is. In that I've, I've worked on, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 different monastic sites which survive in earthwork form, being heavily robbed out with fancy houses built over the top of them, yeah, gardens, gardens on yeah. top, yeah. parks, all the, all the whole shooting match. And in nearly every case, well, almost every case, there's some clues in the lawns and the fields around. There's actually nothing out there. Mm. So if there's nothing out there, and yet there are some clues here, instinctively an experience says, this, mm. is, this is where it is. <laughs> that takes the biscuit, doesn't it? The nun's cloister is here, where we can't find any actual evidence of it in the ground. While over on the lawn, we've uncovered what's been said to be the best-preserved medieval archaeology ever discovered in Bedfordshire. 
With half the base waiting to hear a presentation about what we found, it's time to discuss what we've actually dug up. I mean, this has been an, such a wonderful, wonderful trench. I mean, we've got this wall coming along there and turning. I'm standing on a yard surface where people, this is incredible that people actually yeah. walked around on here. But the real gem of the trench is this wonderful spiral staircase with the steps still in place. And is that round thing the new all post? Yeah? That's the new. Where the, that's where it would have pivoted round from. Great trench. And what about this other one? Oh yes. Well, it's a bit of archaeology in here, isn't oh, it? Oh yes. <laughs> We're very pleased with it. This is absolutely fantastic. And you... I'm prepared to stick my neck out and think, say that we think it's the infirmary and the chapel. Not the nuns' place. Not the nuns' place, but you know, it's a major building. Yeah. See by the quality of this stonework. Fantastic stuff. Are you happy that we've done what we set out to do? I think no question at all. From my point of view, lots of information, major medieval building, defined where the cemetery is, located the other archaeology. It's all we could wish to schedule further and protect and preserve for the future. Mick's ideas about the remains are based on comparisons with other monastic sites. He thinks that what we found is an infirmary, which may have looked like this similar in layout to Revo in Yorkshire, with a chapel off the east end and a cloister attached. Essentially what we found is a complex of buildings, but not big enough to be the nun's cloister. That, as far as most of the team are concerned, was here, on top of the hill. Which means that our Gilbertine monastery probably looked like this in the 13th century. And there's more action from the Time Team over on Civilization next today. Here on Discovery Channel, though, another engineering challenge for the Thunder Race teams, turning old bangers into beauties to race around an obstacle course.